Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. In this video, we're going to talk about sympathetic monsters. We're rolling through October here, and I'm doing some horror-themed videos. And I thought about three monsters. Some of them might not be considered horror, but we'll go through them, that have a sympathetic bend. Now, I don't mean the big bad who has a reason for being evil. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about monsters that maybe have a little bit of justification in their monsterness, if that makes sense. So these are definitely monsters. They are not plotting, scheming types. They're basically creatures to be defeated, usually, but that might create some kind of a deeper story with the players if they encounter such creatures. I'm going to talk about how we can use monsters that already exist to kind of replicate these in our games. They might not be the monsters you think, and kind of maybe little adventure hooks that we can make work with them. The three monsters that I'm going to kind of talk about here are Frankenstein's monster. That's probably the first one everybody thinks about. King Kong and the creature from the Black Lagoon. So each of these monsters is put into a position where they are killing innocent people and the party, being a powerful force, will be the ones brought in to stop them or investigate them or figure out what's going on. Now, I'm going to start off by saying that these are based loosely on the movie versions that I've seen, the older movie versions of these. Maybe not on the original books, if they existed in original books, or future versions or other things that you might see them in other media. So we're going to break them down one at a time, kind of why are they sympathetic, what's going on. And then in the end, I'll talk about the monsters I would use to represent them and how we might use them. So let's talk about the monster, right? Frankenstein's monster. Let's start there. The monster is created and it didn't ask to be created, right? But then more importantly, not only is it created, it is created and then abandoned and rejected by its creator. The monster is left to go out into the world on its own with no idea of what it should be doing. And because of that, its base instinct is anger and destruction or possibly confusion and not understanding what it's doing is wrong. Kong is a great monster, a ruler of its domain, the strongest creature where it exists, worshipped and feared by the people around it. It is then taken out of its environment and brought, basically belittled, partially by force of man, but partially by the wiles, as we might say, of a woman, right? So partially by somebody who pretends on some level, or maybe doesn't pretend how you want to play it, to be its friend. And basically, you now bring this creature that should be in the wild, that's a dangerous creature that's being controlled, or they think they can control it, into a situation where there's a large populace where the creature can then go wild. There's also an old Western movie where they do this with a dinosaur, which is pretty fun. So this idea is take powerful monster, somehow subdue or control it. It could be by magic. It could be by the guile of, of, a, a, sor of, of a woman or a man, right? Who then tricks this monster into thinking, hey, I'm your friend, but then again, kind of leaves it and it doesn't know what to do. And because of its rejection, it goes on a rampage. The creature from the Black Lagoon is a little bit different. Some people say that the original intent of this monster was not to make it sympathetic, but more modern audiences see it as such. So you could see it either way. But basically the creature represents something that we do a lot actually in D&D in these kind of games is we go into an, an environment, a natural environment, and we destroy, desecrate, rob the graves of its ancestors, right? When the movie starts, the creature, the, the, the again, I'm giving away a bit of a spoiler for a movie from the 30s. Maybe that's one from the 50s. The creature's bones, the, the ancestor's bones are being dug up by the architects. So the creature effectively takes revenge. Then they go deeper into the creature's, the, the Black Lagoon, its private sanctum to hunt it. And it's now hunted and defending itself. So again, on some level, it is a near extinct creature that is being hunted by people to bring it back for whatever reason. So the creature is defending itself, you could say. So again, it can be seen as, as sympathetic. But how do we incorporate these things into our games. So let's start with the monster. So we could have two approaches with the monster that would work really nice. One is that the PCs are brought in because it's already on a rampage, right? They show up at a village. 
there's trouble. They're called, hey, you you know have swords and you're adventurers. Help us. There's a creature in the woods. It has killed people. It has killed peasants. It has killed children. Now they go after it. What is this evil creature out there killing things? But, you know, the creature, again, is on a rampage because it doesn't know what to do. And it's really a wild beast, even though its shape, its form is that of a man. The other option would be to have the PCs encounter the, the monster before it goes on any kind of rampage. So pretty much right when it's first rejected, maybe it's angry. Maybe it's just scared. Maybe it's trying to flee. Maybe the however the PCs encounter it, you can play it lots of different ways. Maybe just roll a reaction roll and see what happens. But ultimately in this scenario, and even in the first, it should go back to the creator, right? The monster wants to take revenge on the creator or reconnect with the creator, however you want to look at it. So this is where we go back and find this larger plot. The monster is just out there doing its thing. If you want a larger plot, there's got to be the creator. So what do we use for this? A golem? No. This is the most obvious thing. People say, well, a flesh golem is Frankenstein's monster. Well, yes, in looks it is. But a golem in D&D sense is generally considered mindless and just follows the orders of the creator. Here we want a creature that's going to have its own mind. We want it to be powerful and we want it to be awkward and, and stick out in society. We want it to be strong because uh, it's got to be tough enough to fight a small party if they're going to address it. We'll talk about levels in a second. So I'm going to say an ogre is the perfect example here. Now, an ogre is generally larger than man. And if we read the book and we go by the original movies and stuff, like he's using bigger pieces, right? Larger humans because it's easier to work on. The ogre is strong enough that it can battle a small party, especially first or second levels, and but not so powerful that it can't be taken out. And again, if you have this backstory and you tie it in properly and you leave clues and stuff, the magic user casting that sleep spell and dropping it easy is not going to be a problem because hopefully the party just doesn't go up and stab it through the head, right? They're going to see this as an irregular ogre. It was still built. We still want to keep that golemish part of it where the alchemist or whatever created this creature. We want it to seem odd and strange. This will make the PCs investigate further to find this mad alchemist that's the really the true villain when you think about it. So again, let me roll back here and talk about levels. I probably should have done that first. All of these in monsters are going to be somewhere for a low level party, first, second, third level. And the reason why I say this is if we use a high level party, you, you lose the horror sense of it, right? Horror is on some level about helplessness and the more powerful a party gets when you have a fifth, sixth, seventh level party with magic items and lots of spells, they're not going to be as likely to have to run from the creature when it goes on a rampage. They're not going to have to make a plan. They're just going to go kill it. Now, sure, you could use a giant or give it more hit points, but I don't think that makes it more of a horror creature. It just makes it a longer combat. So I think this is definitely something you could throw at a first level party, maybe a second level. An ogre against a second level party is going to be very deadly and a single hit will be able to wipe out many of the party members, making the 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 monster a tough opponent, but not so tough that it's a, a whole session of a combat because that's not really the idea. And again, a magic user will be able to drop it with a single sleep spell. It's the rest of the story that's interesting. So how do we handle King Kong, right? King Kong is a big, huge thing. Well, you know, in the early, in the original movie, he's not that big. <laughs> and so here we're talking about a giant. And again, this might be for a slightly higher level party, maybe third level. You want it to, you don't want any of these monsters to be the type of thing that a party can just go, well, we're just going to go kill it. Because it's not walk your way through a dungeon, encounter this monster, and then move on, right? The King Kong monster is going to be something that they are going to want to tr handle in an intelligent way, not just a straight up fight. So what's our scenario here? So Kong, again, we're going to use a giant stat block, like a stone giant, but we're not going to make him a stone giant. We're going to make him some kind of a, an ape, right? If we want to be King Kong. And it, it's nice too, because I feel like you can telegraph this to people. And we want to give it the ability to climb, obviously, because it's an ape and jump and stuff. But otherwise, we can use those stats throwing rocks. This giant is going to be too tough for just a small party of second or third level characters to just fight. Again, they're going to have to be smart about it. But also, they shouldn't just run into it. In the King Kong scenario, we want the party to either be part of a larger expedition that's going to capture the thing, which is kind of cool. But I like the idea of it being that the party has come upon this large gathering, maybe multiple villages together or at a city during a special festival, and they see the creature humbled. They see the creature captured. They see the creature 
torn down. Then, either while they're there or when they move to the next town, Kong goes on the rampage. So either while they're there or when they move on to the, like, the middle of the night or whatever, or they're at the next town, that's when Kong goes on the rampage. Now they've got to go out and capture it or kill it. And they know that it was already humbled, right? And hopefully if during this humbled period, they can meet the person, whether it be a man or a woman or somebody who used magic or whatever to help capture it that feels bad about the situation now. So we can try to humanize the monster before the party has to go get it. Now it's a powerful monster that they don't really want to pull their punches because it's going to kill them, right? But at the same time, they're going to be sympathetic to it. They're going to think, is there a way we can capture this or maybe even prevent the original people that captured it from catching it and let it get back to where it came from, right? There's lots of scenarios we can build out of this. The idea, though, is to let the player characters witness this powerful force of nature, this huge beast, humbled, and feel a little bad for it so that when it goes out there and starts killing people, they know that it has to be stopped, but they don't necessarily just want to go out there and put some poison on their crossbow bolt and go kill it. The Creature from the Black Lagoon is a really interesting one because this one, unlike the other two, is something that we can have the player characters set off the problem. They're exploring, they're digging through graves effectively to find treasure when this creature then starts to mess with them. This works best in a place that's if you can set yourself up with an adventure where it's more on rivers or, you know, a la- around a lake, maybe there's some kind of like a dungeon that's kind of at the edge of the lake so they can get into part of it, part of it's underwater. Because for the creature, I would just simply say to use a merman, except mermen are like one hit die. They do say, though, that the leader of the merman is like four hit dice, right? So a four hit die creature, again, against a small party is not unbeatable, but it's tough. A sleep spell could take it out, right? How do we take care of that? Well, this is when we talk about using what is powerful in the movie, which is the creature always works either by stealth or under the water. Now you're taking a party that's second, maybe third level or first level, and you're forcing them to go into an environment they're not used to being into. They're going into an underground situation or an underwater situation, I should say, and they are not set up for it. They can't use all the weapons they normally use. They've got to use spears, maybe crossbows. Spells aren't going to work under the water. At least most of them, you know, cast stress will be able to talk, right? So you're not freely going to be able to cast spells under the water generally. So they've got to either cast a spell from above the water, which means they need to see the creature. If they're, let's say, doing a sleep spell or something, they're going to have a hard time doing that. So now we're taking away a lot of the resources they have and putting them in an odd situation. It's not so much that the the creature from the Black Lagoon is powerful. It's only going to do whatever D6 damage or whatever it does. So it's not necessarily going to kill second, third level characters in one hit, but it's going to be hard to kill, but not because it has a lot of hit points, but because it's clever and it's using its environment. So the creature is great. It's going to be one of those things where you can build up a lot of tension. Maybe they have to travel through this area once they, maybe they go into an area, they raid this watery tomb, and then as they're leaving, they have multiple hexes to travel back up a river Slowly but surely, they're being attacked by the creature that's following them and taking out their henchmen, making putting leaks in their boat so they have to stop for a day to fix it. Now they got to travel, you know, now they're on the land overnight and they, one of them gets attacked in the middle of the night, then it flees back into the water. It takes the, some of their resources. So now they know in order to get out of here, they're going to need to take care of this creature, which is going to be hard to beat. But at the same time, they have stolen the creature's ancestors, right? So we can have it taking things from the the party, like the treasure, which by the way is their experience points, so they don't necessarily want to lose that, right? So it's pulling these treasures back into the water, and perhaps at some point, maybe once they finally defeat the creature and they go down to get more treasure, they realize that what they've done. They see that this is the last of a creature that no longer will exist anymore, that they killed for their own personal gains. And one advantage of using this kind of a monster or this kind of a setup, besides being like classic monster movie, is if we do this early in the campaign with low level characters, we hopefully can create a situation where the party realizes that when they go into a situation and they just start hacking away at monsters to steal their treasure, there might be something more to that. By having the occasional monster that is sympathetic, that's not just a monster, that's not undead that we're just slaying and taking their gold, 
we can start to create the situation where there will be some doubt in the players, where there'll be a little bit of moral question when we do things. And I think this is a much better way to do it, in my opinion, and has been at my tables, than the you kill a bunch of orcs and then you see there's baby orcs and what do you do? Because nobody wants to be in that situation. I don't want to know what your players will do. I don't want to know what my players will do in that situation. I would much rather have this kind of situation where it is something that can defend itself, but it also is sympathetic because of the situation. It's a way to put the the question of moral into the game without it being too heavy handed. And again, helps to teach the players that maybe they should look deeper into a story before they just go into the woods and hunt monsters. So I would love to know how you use monsters like this. If you have, if you haven't, if you want to run one of these scenarios, I would love to know how it works out for you. Go ahead and let me know in the comments. Also, check the description here. You're going to find a link to my Discord server where you can join up and talk to other people like you that love RPGs over there and a link to my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel in that way. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel and I'll talk to you soon.